As I'm deep excited. breaths as you can take in now. Yes, it's all it's all here. <laughs> yeah, deep to about here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not much of a depth. <laughs> Look at all these wonderful people that came to see. Oh, this is quite so sweet there. For sure, I didn't recognize you with your hair all straightened <laughs> in the mask. Okay, I'm just sending a couple people the link. Do you need some?
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Bonjour. Bonjour. This is Julia Breckenridge. You guys already know that. Julia is presenting her incredible senior project with us this morning. Um, we've got this wonderful big space. She's got this wonderful crowd. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Can you do us a favor, please? Do Julia a favor and make sure that your cell phone is silenced. Um, even if you think you already did it, please check it again. It would be very distracting. We don't want to do that to Julia. Thank you all so much. So, um, yeah, without further ado, Julia. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Breckenridge, as, as you know. Um, next year, I'll be attending Middlebury College to major in museum studies and uh, possibly theater. And so I wanted to do something that related to that in my senior project. Uh, so my essential question is, how do I recreate a garment from a visual source? To support this, I have the sub-essential question of how do I best alter a pattern to match a visual source? What are the techniques and processes necessary to recreate the garment? What is the context behind the visual source? So here's my visual source, um, sorry. And it is the portrait of Deborah Hall by William Williams. It's in the Brooklyn Museum. Just a couple things that I'm gonna point out here on the painting and then probably again on myself. These pieces here, these, um, this V, these are called the robings. I'm gonna mention them a couple times. I don't know exactly why they're called robings. It's what my outside expert called them and I was like, okay, great. <laughs> these, <laughs> these are the engagement, the sleeves. Um, and they're just like the fancy frilly bits. I don't know what that means in French. It probably just is a word that they used. Um, this is the corsage thing that I, I made actually last night. Oops. Uh, I thought it was embroidery. It's not. It's flowers, which made it easier for me. These are. This is the outer gown. Uh, oops. And this is <laughs> the pink trim that falls along the sides. Uh, this is the petticoat, the silk petticoat. Um, this is the stomacher. And just to talk a little bit about the painting itself, there's a lot of symbolism in the art. This relief here, this is Daphne and Apollo. So it depicts the myth of when D Apollo wanted Daphne and she didn't want him back, so she turned into a tree to avoid him, which represents chastity, but should probably represent other things. <laughs> this um, rose bush here, it represents beauty, and she's plucking a rose, which means she's ready for marriage. Um, she was quite young, even for 18th century, she was 16 in this portrait, so that's slightly problematic. <laughs> here, this is a pet squirrel, um, and this represents obedience, uh, which doesn't make sense to me either because it's a wild animal, but I guess she tamed the wild animal. She has patience and now the squirrel has obedience. And then the garden in the background, that's just wealth. That just represents that her family has money, so she's gonna have a big dowry. So my outside expert is Carol Wood. She works at Middlebury as the costume shop director, and she has been so helpful to me throughout this whole process. She also was a draper at the San Francisco Opera, so she had a lot of expertise to share with me, which was extremely helpful. The first thing I'm gonna talk about are the undergarments. And now you might be thinking like, oh, 18th century panties. But no, this is, this is super, super important to the dress. It creates the shape. And you have to start with any historical costume. You just start from the skin out. And this creates the shape that the dress is going to sit on. Uh, 18th century clothing is not like our modern clothing. Like I can't like wiggle around too much in this. It's pretty rigid. And that actually increases the longevity of the costume. I mean, the, the dress, if you're wearing it, then at the time it was just clothing. Um, it increases the longevity and it makes it alterable. And also, if you change shape, you don't have to get new clothes. Like, you can put on 5, 10, 15, probably even 30 pounds if you're willing to squish a little bit, and you can fit the same clothes. So that meant that you could have the same clothes for longer, which would save you money. Also, it creates um, the iconic conical shape, which you see in a lot of 18th century clothing, which is very um, accurate to the time. And you can definitely see, like, if you're a costumer, you want to make sure you have the right stays or the right corset, because otherwise your dress won't look right. Um, so here's some process pictures. Uh, stays 
don't have a tech, they don't open in the front. And that's the difference between stays and corsets. So this seam here, oops, this seam here gets sewn up. These are the pieces individually. I flatline them in a very stiff fabric that is often used for corsets. It's not quite historically accurate. It's called coutille, um, and it doesn't have that much give. And then there's linen, which has more give on the front just for appearance, because it's pretty. Um, I put in synthetic whalebone, which is made out of plastic, but it mimics baleen. It's just we're not killing whales anymore. And there's a lot of bones in this. This has 20 bones, this one piece here. This has 20 bones, and each, bo each piece has fewer bones as you go toward the back. But it's still, it's, it's quite rigid. And I wanted to use a combination of historically accurate and theater techniques. So the way that the pieces are boned, that's accurate. But the way that it's assembled is a bit more theater-esque. Um, and this is where my outside expert really helped me, because she, she has expertise in theater. The pieces are made individually, the front piece and the two back pieces with seams at the sides, so that I can alter them if I want to. I can just undo the side seams and then change it that way versus the way that it would be done historically is all the seams would be inside. So I'd have to undo the entire thing to get to the, in, in the seams that are inside the fabric itself. So this is just a much easier way to do it. And I could come back in 30 years and I could change this corset, I mean this stays, and I could wear it again. Or I could change it for somebody else. And this is important in theater because you do one show like six weeks and then you have these stays and it takes about two weeks if you have like a team, if not six weeks to make a pair of stays. So you want to be able to change them so you don't have to make a new pair of stays with each actress. Um, here are the pieces right before they go together. This is what it looks like on me. Uh, so the, the back is not closed. And you, you notice that probably if you've seen costume dramas, they always close it all the way. There's always like a foot on the back and they're like, she's holding on to like a banister. That's not accurate. People lived in these things. Um, like, you had to be able to breathe. I can breathe in this, not as fully. I can't breathe into my stomach, but I can still breathe. I'm still, I'm still okay. <laughs> and so this, this gap in the back allows for me to be able to move a little bit. It's breathable. Um, and the, the laces here, they can stretch a bit. So it's more comfortable to have it open. Also, the uh, pocket hoops on the side, they make the waist look smaller. It's all about contrast. Also, it's all about showing wealth. More fabric can cover, you have bigger hoops, more fabric. Um, and they're very, they're nice. They're pockets, I can show you. I can get my whole arm in here. I can fit <laughs> a lot of stuff in this pocket. <laughs> It's wonderful. And then the, the petticoat sits on top of the pockets and just prevents their being an uh, indent where the pockets end. So my next step was patterning and mock-ups. Once I knew the painting, I could then start to break, and I had the undergarments, I could start to actually work on the dress itself. A mock-up is just a test run. It's like a first draft in a cheaper fabric that you can throw away, you can mark with Sharpie, you can do whatever you want to it because the fabric was like two bucks a yard. Um, so the first thing I did was I made a basic mock-up, I just copied the pattern. And then once I had that mock-up, I could put it on and I could make changes for fit and length. And then I copied that to the pattern. Um, this is, I did this using a method called slash and spread, which I learned from my outside expert. Um, you, when you're making a piece bigger, you don't want to add to the sides and then just leave it at that because that'll change the entire shape of the garment. You want to cut, make cuts in the middle or along the vertical lines of the piece and then add or subtract from the center because that way it can keep the, the shape and it can keep the curves. So I ended up making two cuts in the piece and I, um, horizontally and I extended it by two inches because I have a longer torso. Once I had copied the, the two inch extension on the pattern into the, um, on the mock-up into the pattern, I could do it again, make another mock-up, then I could make changes for the appearance. I needed to adjust the way that the hip lay along the, like, the hip seam here. I don't know if you can see it on me. Um, and then I needed to add a little bit in the front because there's pleats that are smaller knife pleats along the front versus the big um, deep pleats, which I'll show you pictures of later. Um, so I needed to add a little bit so that I could fit those pleats in. Then once I had the changes, when oh, I made the robing, um, oops, I made the robing pattern pieces. Then I copied those to the pattern, made another mock-up just to check, and then I was ready to start cutting out. Here's some pictures of the mock-up. This is the lining. Um, 
It has a back piece that is adjustable, as well as a front that is laced. And this is this holds the shape of the dress. This is what the taffeta kind of just lays on. So this takes the brunt of the wear, and it sits right against the stays. You didn't have zippers or elastic or anything like that in the 18th century, so you had to have ways to adjust your clothing so that it could fit on you. If you ate a big meal and you wanted to have looser stays, you could loosen it up. If you want, or had a ball and you wanted to look super tiny, you could, you could tight lace, you could squish yourself down a bit, and you could squish the lining as well by adjusting the, the back here. And that way you could wear it for longer and have different events that you'd wear it to. This is the back. These are the pleats that I have here um, in the mock-up. And this took six hours, just this one piece. So that was, it was a lot of work. When I went to do the um, dress itself, I ended up using a different method, which was faster. Here's the pattern pieces. As you can see, I slashed and spread in this back piece quite a lot. And I slashed and spread this piece as well. This is the robing piece. Now I have my pattern pieces. I'm ready for construction. The first step is to prepare the fabric. Taffeta shrinks when it's exposed to heat. But um, it's because it's a form of silk, you can't get it wet. Most fabric, you would pre-wash it, but you can't just toss silk into the washing machine. You would destroy it completely. So I had to steam it. And um, I did this. I steamed it um, with an iron, and then I rolled it on this big PVC pipe that my dad got for me at Home Depot. <laughs> and this is what that looks like, this roll here. And then once I had it rolled up on that, there's a different type of rolling that I had to do, which is after I cut the pieces, you have to set the curves in. So when you're thinking about a curve on anything, the outside with two layers, the outside curve is going to be bigger than the inside curve. If you do this with fabric, if you construct it flat and then curve it, the outside fabric piece is going to have a lot of stress on it, and the inside fabric piece is going to wrinkle. And that doesn't look nice. So what you do, this is another theater technique that my outside expert taught me, you take this big like, concrete roller <laughs> and you roll the pattern piece on it and then you do a big stitch along the edge just to keep that piece rolled so that when you go to sew it, it keeps that curve and you're able to have a nice smooth fit. I ended up learning a lot of stitching techniques because the thing about 18th century clothing is it was not created for sewing machines. Sewing machines weren't even invented. So you had to think of other ways to manage the way that the seams went together. And a lot of these, you have to go through one layer but not two, or two layers but not three. So I ended up using a lot of 18th century stitching techniques. This is how I did the sleeves. So I ended up having one piece. Construction part two. So I sew. Sorry, I'm not going to do the sound for that. So <laughs> you don't need to. You, you already. I'm already talking. I ended up sewing one um, side of the outside layer into the fabric, into the lining, and then I flipped it around and rolled it on my arm. Then I did a quick, um, like a whip stitch along the top, and it was very hidden. You can't even see the seam. And that is how I get the nice roll on my arm that fits well. And then I set it into the back. The folds need to be at the shoulder blades so that you have better movement. I ended up not having them quite there. You can see on this side, it's a little, shh, don't tell anyone, it's a little bit too high up. And this is what it looks like with the sleeves in, but none of the decoration added. And you can see the way that it laces up in the front. All right, let me pause it. Oops, hello there. Uh, <laughs> the next step is the pleating of the back. And this, as I mentioned before, took a lot of work. Um, and I ended up having a new method that I used, and it was color coding. So each pleat got a different color, and then I would stitch along the line in that color. So pleat one was red, pleat two was orange, that and so on. There's six pleats per side. It was a, like 12 pleats for the whole back. It was a considerable amount of work. And this was an idea my outside expert had, so that I could just prep it, and then I just put it together. It was super easy, and it went a lot quicker. Oh, why does it do that? Sorry. And you can see here, I'm adding the pleats. And this is what it looks like at the end. And it's super pretty. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, I want to just quickly show you here the pattern pieces cut out. And you see there's two layers that I ended up rolling. This is the back after the pleats on my dress form, just to clear a picture. Um, the next step after I had the back set in was fitting. 
and the that way that the front fits over the back, you really have to set everything in place because um, 18th century clothing or mantua is constructed on a body, not flat. So I had these front pieces sewn at the seams. I tested the folds on the back. I sewed on the, the side things and I was ready to fit. So here you can see it's really baggy, it's really loose. And then I had my mom pin it and the back piece went under the front piece. And this is what it looks like after the fitting. And my mom did a great job. Thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> the next step, um, once everything was fitted, is all the trim. And this is gathered using a whip stitch as well. And she's just like a big loopy stitch. And um, this took hours and hours. My teachers will know because I was doing it in their class that <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of just little work. It was these little bubbles of fabric that I then sewed like this. Um, and then I pulled it tight and that is how I got the trim attached. And I sewed it in place there, as you can see. Um, there's the fitted, there's this, the, um, this is another step of the fitting. I had to set the pleats in the front. Let's see if I can show you these knife pleats along the front of the skirt. And I had to do that multiple times, but I got it right. This is the fitting, checking the robings before I put on any of the decoration. Um, the front I had to do a couple times because the way that it was bagging. And here's the final like constructed piece before I put on all the trim. I shared my project on TikTok, which was really fun because I didn't. I wanted to have a way to share it with a broader community that wasn't just my presentation. But it's a COVID year. Like, what do you what do you do? It would be really stressful to plan something. People probably wouldn't want to come because of COVID, not safe. And so I shared this TikTok, which I will play out. Oop. It's been what I've been working on for the past several. So this dress has been what I've been working on for the past several months. It's a dress from 1766. The painting is by William Williams. It's in the Brooklyn Museum. And it is a combination of Florabella Francaise and an English gown. For the past several months, I've been working on the stays. These are the stays. They are green linen with synthetic whalebone. And then the petticoat and the hoops. And since then, I've been working on the mock-up and the patterning which I can talk more about later. After hours of patterning, I have my finished pattern and I cut it out of the taffeta. All the pieces are cut out and now it's just time for construction. This dress is probably gonna take at least until like the spring. It's a big, big project and I picked something very difficult so this dress has so many different things about it. Um, so this is where I'll document that process. And I shared that on TikTok and it got 60,000 views, which was overwhelming. <laughs> I, was, I, I didn't have, like, I was not prepared for that many people to see it. Uh, and so the, oh, no, this is not, okay. Uh, then I ended up having like 3,000 followers, which is not a lot for TikTok, but it was a lot for me. <laughs> and they, I, I posted each step of the way, my different uh, things that I had done, and it was really fun, and it was just a great way to share. So before I talk about the final product, I'm gonna talk about the history and context behind the dress. So um, Mantua is the 18th century clothing that is on top, that you see that is draped on top of the stays. Pre uh, Mantua, you would have a decorated pair of stays and a skirt, um, but Mantua was the fabric on top of the stays and it's usually attached to the skirt in some way. And this was often a female dominated industry, which is super cool. The tailors did not like this and they set up a whole bunch of guilds to try and limit what women could do. Um, you can see that in the clothing as well. So this is all about the drape, it's all about the way that the fabric lays, and this is really beautiful, this is 1700s, early Mantua. Um, and you can see there's very minimal decoration, and this is because of the guild system. Women were not allowed to, um, well couturiers and um, Mantua makers were not allowed to use other fabrics to decorate the dress. So at the beginning they were like, okay, just it's all about the fabric, all about the way it lays. Um, and then as it got more in, like fancy, this is 1740s, I love this. You could steal a TV in this dress <laughs> and I just love it. <laughs> you can see that there's still very minimal decoration but the fabric is very fancy and it has this V shape which my dress also has which is why I pulled this picture. Um, and you can see here it has the engage line. You're starting to see elements of my dress start to come in. Uh, and then as you get into the 1760s, that was 1740s, um, the dresses have more decoration, but it's all in the same fabric as the dress. And this was the way that the mantua makers kind of worked around the guild system. 
And also, you would have things altered a lot. I think this dress was altered because this is not se this is separated from the actual body of the dress. This is an extra piece. And you would alter your dresses a lot. You would have one dress. Maybe it was even bequeathed to you in a will because fabric was so expensive. You wouldn't want to buy fabric. And you would try and keep that dress and just change it to fit the styles. But styles would change every 10 years. So you could have a dress for 20, 30, 40 years. As long as you, the fabric held up, you were able to deal, like, keep on having it. And this is another reason why a lot of 18th century clothing, you look at the waist and you're like, oh gosh, so tiny, so tiny. And that's because it was something someone was only able to wear once because they were so tiny then. And then they've grown out of it since and they haven't been able to alter it. You can always take away, you can't really add. And so the only surviving clothes are the ones that people weren't able to wear again and again and again. This is after the French Revolution, and you can see there's a drastic change from this to this. It's very soft, it's very cottony, flowy, Grecian styles, and this was really because of the not wanting to be associated with the aristocracy. Here's my dress. Uh, the girl in the painting is um, Actually, I did some research. Her dad was a printer who worked with Ben Franklin, which is super cool. Like, who would have thunk it? I guess it was just a small world. So I thought that that was really fun. I don't know much about her after that, but I'd like to think that she, she found someone that she loved and it wasn't a creepy marriage. <laughs> And then here's my final product. Um, you've seen it on me, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But I, I added the engagement, the back, everything, all the decoration elements. I had, didn't have this thingy yet. Um, like I said, I made it last night. <laughs> and uh, here's some close-ups of the side. You can see the, smooth, the fit is very smooth. Um, the sleeves, I made these in class as well, <laughs> the engagement pieces. And now I want to get to my thank yous. Um, a huge, huge thank, thank, thank you to my outside expert, Carol Wood. She has been through this whole process with me. She's pushed me to work harder and to, to push my skills a little bit. And then she's kept me in check where I was like, oh, I want to just draft the whole pattern. I don't want to use a pattern. And she was like, no, that will take way too much time. And she's just been so lovely. She met with me every other week, sometimes every week. and. Like, I could not have done this without her. It was, she's been just so incredibly helpful. I also want to thank Elisa, my lovely mentor. Uh, she's been so wonderful. She's let me do my thing when I needed to do my thing, and she's helped me when I needed help, and you've just been so supportive, so thank you. So I want to thank my panel. You guys have been so great. Um, you're always so nice to me in the meetings, and I just thank you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I want to thank my parents. They bought the silk, which was which was no, an inconsiderable thing, and my mom for doing all the fittings and dealing with me crying over this project at like 9 p.m. And of course, my friends, my lovely friendsies, for helping me get dressed today and for <laughs> helping me out and like all the little things throughout this whole process. So thank you guys. Any questions? Okay, so this is this is a good question. So an English gown is um, it doesn't have this back, um, and it was generally I think that it was just they didn't want to be French, so they kind of. incorporate both styles. Also, they weren't fashion designers then. It was like you would see fashionable women, like Marie Antoinette was often a fashion person that someone would follow, but you, were, you didn't have like the Gucci show that you would go and you would like get ideas from. It was, it was very much each individual would create their own style and their own dresses. It's Paige. Uh
I honestly don't really know what made me choose the picture. Like, I, I was just kind of drawn to it. I thought, and I was like, that's the one. And I can't really, like, I, I just, I loved it. I loved the dress. I loved the flowers. I loved the little squirrel. I think it was this page. It was the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely the squirrel. And it was so hard to find 360 pictures. Actually, I didn't even realize it was a Robe la Francaise till after my outside expert was like, that has a Francaise back. And I was like, oh, yay, I love those. But because it, it's such an obscure painting, it was really hard to find like pictures of it that were nice and good quality and up close. Yes, Tara? So actually, there's a pretty, not, it's not big, but there's a, there's a community that makes these clothing. Um, and I, the pattern that I grabbed was just a basic um, Robella Francaise, and it was my outside expert who recommended it to me. Um, I was going to work from uh, the American Duchess book, which is a really wonderful resource. I used it for a lot of the steps, but they don't give you a paper pattern. And so my outside expert was like, you're going to want a paper pattern. You're going to want to be able to hold it and manipulate it. And so I, I got, it's like Recollections of J.P. Ryan. It's kind of an older pattern, but it was really good. It had all the shapes I needed. It was nice instructions. But yeah, there's a lot on the internet if you just like look it up. Jenny. Uh, how important was it for you to know the model in your dressmaking? In other words, did you get to know her first or the dress? I got to know the dress first. Um, I honestly wasn't sure if there was going to be that much on her because she's a woman. And history doesn't really keep track of women a lot. I really, I love, I was drawn to the dress first. Um, but once I had spent a lot of time with the dress, I was like, I want to know her. Like, what's her story? And I wasn't able to find anything about, like, where she ended up being or, like, what happened to her beyond the fact that her dad had that painting done. Yeah, Terry? Um, so you mentioned a lot of hand stitches. Will you use the sewing machine for anything or just pull the hands up? I use the sewing machine for these seams on the side, the big skirt seams. And... I think that's it. Oh, I, the, the lining. The lining, too. So, like four seams. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarah? Uh, what was one of the bigger challenges that you faced when you were doing this? And it's a two-part question. And then also, do you foresee continuing to construct in this way? You talked about going into museum studies. Are you particularly interested in historical fashion and clothing? Would you like to continue that after? Like, how are you feeling now? So the challenge that was hardest for me, I think, is just fit. It's, it's incredibly hard. I actually didn't do it right. Um, if you look at the back, I have, hold on, I'm going to turn around and stop talking. I have like these funky, um, well, it's really loud, these funky um, pleats right at the top of, right at the waist and the top of the skirt. And this was because I made the back piece a little too long and to like kind of hitch it up a little bit. Um, and I think that was just the hardest part is like with the patterning and then with the, the dress, once you get to fit, you see all the little mistakes that you made along the way and they add up to like problems. But I was, I was, I'm still very happy with it. I'll, I'll turn around so you guys can actually see what I'm talking about here. They're the pleats that kind of have a, um, an angle toward the back. Like right here. Yeah. Quite as they should be. <laughs> and in the future, I absolutely want to do this. I, I'm thinking museum studies right now because I am more interested in the academics behind it. But I mean, if BBC offers me a job making this, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> yeah, Ev? Uh, so, was there anything about the era of the dress, like 1740s, the TV. This is 1760, but it's okay. Was there any element of history that sort of drew to it, or did you explore more after getting into the dress? I think it's mostly like, I, I don't know, I find 
I find the, I, I've always like been obsessed with the French Revolution, even as like a very small child. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that it was, I just love the shape. And I haven't worked that much in 18th century, so I was really like intrigued by it. It has a lot of very interesting techniques that you use, a lot of interesting like ways to sew things. And I just, I just think it's so pretty. <laughs> So that was a lot of what drew me to this specific dress in this specific era. I love the Frances back. I just, it feels like a cape. <laughs> yes, Bonnie? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so my TikTok is sewing.history. Um, I, can, I can give it to anyone who's curious about it and who wants to, to find me. Um, and I don't know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this dress. Um, it's probably going to go on my dress form, Muriel, for a little longer. Um, but I hope to have like an 18th century picnic with other costumers that I can wear it to, or even a ball. A ball would be incredible. I really want to go to a ball. <laughs> Uh, Katie. How long did it take you to make a Oh gosh, thousands of hours. I started the stays in the, um, in the, I think in June. Um, and then it's just, it's eight months. I just say eight months to make this whole thing. I don't even know how many individual hours. Yeah, Terry? I mean, if we're not counting hours of labor, uh, just the materials, I think it was close to 700. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> no? Dad's saying no? How much was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought the taffeta was 300. Okay, it was 700 for the taffeta. I'll have to go check my costing sheet. But it, yeah, it was, it was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> yeah, Zach? How has this been stored? Like, did Mary Antoinette just have a bunch of mannequins? Like I actually don't know how to store mine, honestly. I feel like um, they would definitely be hung and probably hung in a special way that doesn't put stress on the seams. You wouldn't wash any of it. You would brush it. And then if the stain was really bad, you would just kind of like take the piece out and like shift it so that the stain was hidden. Uh, I pre I'm pretty sure they hung them. Um, I'm not sure. Also, Marie Antoinette didn't wear a bunch of her stuff over again, but she would have given it to her ladies' maids, who then would have probably given it, like, passed on. And sometimes, like, you'll see stories of, like, someone's poor relations who are, like, farmers somewhere just get a shipment of, like, fancy dresses, and they're like, well, what do I do with this? <laughs> yeah. Do you believe in reincarnation? Yes. <laughs> yes. I am definitely a reincarnation of some fancy lady, I feel like. That'd be cool. <laughs> That'd be pretty fun. <laughs> you